Our topic today comes from a colleague who is a neurologist who thinks very much that doctors today, anywhere in the world, are no longer asking frequently enough the big questions, the existential questions. So he protests that we spend too much time in reductionism. Now, I've just come from a wonderful tour of your simulation lab. Your simulation lab is full of miracles, and I congratulate you for having such tools available. That is dependent on the reductionism of science, coming up with practical ways to improve your teaching. I myself have benefited from the reductionism in medicine which allowed the doctors when I had a postpartum hemorrhage to exactly pinpoint the problem and offer a solution, which saved my life. So I'm not protesting about the consequences of our emphasis on reductionism, but I'm saying we must expand, stand back, and look at the lessons learned for this existential calling, which is healing. The other person who contributed to this topic of what is the purpose of medicine is my adopted daughter, who is an internist. She works as a hospitalist, but she comes from a highland village in Kenya. And throughout her childhood, the only medical care she received was from Doctors Without Borders. So she grew up with a wonder and awe about the capacities and the calling of being a physician and being able to help other people. She came to this country with $300, or came to America with $300, which her village had raised for her, thinking that with a sponsorship and those $300, she would be able to pay for medical school. Yes, it was a shock, shall we say, what happened. I got to know her because I run a small foundation which gives scholarships and helps people out in crises. And within a very short time, a matter of hours, she became my daughter. She said to me, last week in fact, Nobody is talking about the moral dilemmas that face doctors, especially young doctors, as they go into practice, knowing that the systems are generally against good medicine and compassionate healing. So she said, what can I say to my colleagues who want to leave the career or only practice a very small specialty about the moral dilemmas and the courage required to be a doctor. So our purpose, or our topic today, is what is the purpose of medicine? Now I'm sure some of you have heard people say, oh, it's to combat death. Well, I'm sorry to say that is doomed to failure because we all die. So combating death is a temporary goal shall we say, but not a purpose. You can then say, well, what about ameliorating suffering? Is that the purpose of medicine? Perhaps, but again, wouldn't it be better to prevent suffering in the first place? To find out what is the cause? What is the foundation of suffering? So maybe ameliorating and preventing suffering could be the purpose of medicine. But then you come to the question raised by our worldwide statistics and our, of course our universal human experience. We really spend very little time as individuals in contact with our health professionals or in contact with the hospitals around us. In our lives, those are very sporadic events. So 
What about the rest of our lives? Does medicine have something to say to us about the lives outside of a medical care system? And that's where I would like us to think about healing as the purpose of medicine, not the sporadic or event intervention, but the healing of your patient and the family they come from, the community they come from, the nation. I think only if we really focus on the person we are treating and the whole of their context of life, of life do we really address the purpose of medicine. Now, a lot of you know that the, at least the Western medicine is focused on symptoms and focused on the minutia. Um, I get very irritated with my primary care physician when she tells me the computer says this. And I say, but I'm not the computer. And I have tried to teach her because she's so much younger, that the computer is not a colleague. The computer is a tool. A, f a farmer is not made a good farmer by having a hoe, but he may be a better farmer if he learns to use the hoe. So remember, the computer is not a colleague and never will be, despite the wonderful simulation lab and despite the algorithms that make your learning in that lab possible. So at the moment, you're facing an opportunity. How do you redefine medicine, particularly post the pandemic? We saw throughout the world the grave dangers of letting politicians and even worse lawyers make clinical decisions on our behalf. Uh, we know that they should never have been trusted with our, the definition of what was appropriate care. We also know, because I interviewed a number of doctors during the pandemic, that our emphasis on specialty care has overwhelmed and disregarded public health. A thoracic surgeon said to me in the midst of the pandemic, I'm ashamed. He said, throughout my career, we have always looked at those who chose either infectious diseases or public health as not really good doctors. If they'd been good doctors, they would have chosen oncology or surgery or something more appropriate as a specialty. Now, he says, we can't do what they do. We don't know how to approach the patients, and we are humbled, and I'm ashamed. So post-COVID, we have the obligation as healthcare professionals, no matter whether we are physicians or ethicists or social workers or anthropologists, to take this opportunity and ask ourselves, what are we doing in regard to individual and community health as physicians? How are we using what we know in diagnoses and in treatment to go beyond the immediate symptom? And I wanted to share with you Jonas Salk's diagnostic questions. Yesterday I was with your nutrition school and Lenore asked, Dr. Ely asked the students, how many of you know who Jonas Salk was? So I'll ask that question. How many of you know who Jonas Salk was? Yes. He developed the first effective and still most effective vaccine against poliomyelitis at a time when over 55,000 children in the United States alone were suffering from infantile paralysis every summer. Many of them affected for the rest of their lives. Many of them died. Many of them were fully paralyzed. 
But after his success with that, in the early 50s, he founded the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in La Jolla, California, in order to promote fundamental research in every aspect of human biology that could be explored. And today, all these decades later, it is the most cited private research institute in medicine in the world. So I asked him one time when we were working together, a lot of people come to you, Jonas, with a problem or distress. What is your diagnostic protocol? So these are his questions. First, tell me a story of a time when you felt fully alive, fully vital, and involved in life. Tell me a story. That was his first question. His second question was, who shared that? Who or what was part of that experience? The third question, what would you like other people to know, or your grandchildren to know, or the future physician to know about the importance of that experience? And the fourth and final question, what is preventing you today from having that feeling and from feeling vital and involved? Do I need to repeat any of those? No? You got it. So, what do those four questions tell us? They reframe the focus of medicine away from the symptom, away from the immediate pain and the immediate moment, uh, the episode, to the actual life of the patient. They reframe the focus of the doctor's skills because now it's not a short-term intervention. It's an existential intervention. And whatever happens between the two, the patient and the doctor, affects both. The patient is sometimes the teacher. The doctor is often, and should be often, the student. And it takes us away from the individualism, the focus on just the individual patient or just the symptom, to the context of healing. What will the patient do when they leave your office or when they leave the hospital? What happens between visits? Who is going to take on the care? Is the family going to have the resources to do what I think I should prescribe? I remember a very vivid example of a young man in extreme pain and distress after a motorcycle accident and the trauma group in the emergency room stabilized him very quickly, recognized that the appearance of his injuries were, was much worse than the actuality of his injuries. So he was on a gurney, having been stabilized, waiting for a room. And a nurse came in and looked at him and began to talk to him. And she said to him, are you hungry? And the young man said, I haven't eaten in three days. Well, that was the explanation for his motorcycle accident. He had been dizzy. He had been unable to focus on where he was going. So this, these questions uh, that Jonas Salk used and the attention to the whole person take us to a completely different focus of medicine. The premises behind the focus on healers and healing are very simple. The first is mutuality. I've already mentioned the patient is the teacher. The physician, the doctor, is the student. And then it changes. Then the doctor has an obligation to teach the, the patient what is necessary. And it's very interesting. My daughter was telling me, she's now teaching at residence, having just finished her residency. And she said, I'm so delighted when one of my new students says, I didn't understand, because it gives me the opportunity to say, 
Now you know what the patient is feeling. The patient doesn't understand. So approach the encounter with the patient as if you are both learning a new language. The patient doesn't understand your medical language and you don't understand the patient. So approach the encounter as though you have to translate her, her world or his world into your world and your world into his. So mutuality is the first thing. The second is in our view of human life and human evolution, we must remember that evolution is not just an error making process, it is an error correcting process. So there is every reason for us to be practically optimistic that these things that we see as very discouraging trends, you all I'm sure are aware of the deaths of despair which have been publicized. That is uh, taking only the negative and the negative discourse, the catastrophic language of our media as the full picture of what's going on. But underneath that, evolution is an error correcting process. Here in Guatemala, there is wonderful work being done with regenerative agriculture, for instance, with women's empowerment, microfinancing, all these things that raise up the possibility and the opportunity for people who are in adverse circumstances. Uh, focus on the positive, make sure the positive messages of what is being learned are broadcast. And don't hesitate to say, fear will make you sick, because it does. And we all need to remember that. And the final point about the premises is cultivate your common sense. Yesterday we asked um, what meals the nutritionist viewed as celebrations. And I was very struck that many of the young people said, time with my grandmother, Thanksgiving with my grandmother. Our real obligation, it seems to me, is to learn what other people know, to learn what the generations who are ahead of us have learned and used as skills. They may not be academic, they probably weren't academic, but what is their common sense? What is their wisdom? And what wisdom can we learn by paying attention to them? So I would argue that as we try and re redefine health, we should redefine it as vitality, as connection to life, and look always to how we can enhance vitality. One of my colleagues was so distraught a number of years ago at the emphasis on the leading causes of death as the only thing that the statisticians were interested in, that he came up with an idea to publicize the leading causes of life. Now, his idea is there are five main ones. Connection, connection to others, because we define ourselves in relationship always. Agency, the understanding that we are the actors who shape our lives. Coherence, how do we make sense of our lives? That's the question that has fascinated me since I was a very small child. I apparently caused my father to considerable trauma by stopping in the street when I was three and asking him a question. Why do people only smile at us after we have smiled at them? My father repeated that story as long as he was alive. But the issue is this. We have and we must use our own agency to overcome the fear that, of what we encounter and to make sure that our reaction to our circumstances does not define us because that leads the um, 
circumstances defining us rather than we are defining us. The next one of the five is generativity. Generativity means being humble and grateful to the past, but creating something positive to leave to the future. And generativity is true in any transformative interaction. And you all know, I'm sure, that despite the language of Western medicine, an encounter with a patient is not a transaction. A transaction is a business purchase or a one-to-one -one exchange. Your encounter with your patient is an existential transformation, and transformation are absolutely dynamic. We are commonly bombarded in the United States by the term the social determinants of health. And I would say to you, there's no such thing as a determinant of health. We have the social dynamics, which are uh, evidence of what happens uh, as we interact with our environment and with each other, each other, but there are no determinants. And the final of the five is hope. We all need hope. When we're really hurting and in pain, we hope someone will help us to feel better. When we're really um, feeling our world has crashed around us and there's no way forward, we catch a glimpse of hope. Somehow, usually in the eyes of someone else, or in my case, often with my dogs. Uh, but hope keeps us going. Hope gives us energy. So out of these leading causes of life, you can see that you can change the conversation. I would certainly add, because Einstein said it was holy, curiosity. I think curiosity is a leading cause of life and that we need to pursue it, even though it always takes courage. Just before we started, I was saying, I cannot fathom, I stand in wonder before the first doctor who did a cataract operation or the first doctor who did a particular procedure. What courage, what trauma did that doctor go through? And how did they recover from it? If the patient didn't do well, how did they say, I know this is right, I will keep going? You will need a lot of courage as you go forward, but remember, curiosity, what's next? What can I do? How can I be of help? will keep you going. I would also add, and you know this because you're in medical school, commitment. You have to have the discipline, the dis determination to persevere. My adopted daughter was going to give up in the midst of organic chemistry in her first semester in medical school. My phone bill was horrendous, but we got her through it, and her organic chemistry professor nominated her for the award for the most improved student in his classes. She did not give up. You will have to find that same courage, no matter what you encounter. You're going to have patients die, you're going to have adverse events affect your patients. You're going to have patients get very angry with you and say, no, I won't do that. I won't take that medicine. I don't believe in it. It takes courage to be a healer rather than just a doctor to say, what is the best thing for the long run and for me as I learn how to go forward. So, I'm now old and I am reflecting on the lessons learned in life. And one of the things I've decided I would like to do, and Dr. Ely has been helping me with this for a number of years, 
I would like to see the world create an epidemic of health. I would like to see us commit to the dynamism, the possibility, and above all, the humility to learn from our lessons learned and learn from each other. We have a responsibility. You as students will very soon encounter the very frightening and sobering uh, experience of we have to be everything to this patient. During COVID, my daughter had to be a substitute for the family, a substitute for the friends. She had to hold people's hand when they wept with loneliness, not with pain from their physical condition, but just loneliness that they were so isolated. You will find that being responsible for everything for your patient requires something that now that you're young, you may not have thought of. You must take care of your own vitality. You cannot give vitality to others unless you take care of it. So find out for yourselves what heals you what do you need when things go wrong? What do you need when you feel you just can't take another step forward? Find that out as soon as you can and keep it close to you, remember. So in conclusion, I would say you're facing a mystery. The, one of the things that this morning has shown me, first of all, by seeing a video of what's now known about the fascia, and then going into the simulation lab, is health remains a mystery. We know a little. We know enough to prevent ourselves from doing harm a lot of the time. But we do not understand yet all the details of what is healing and what is health. It's an exciting journey. Thank you. Mm -hmm.